الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد والحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلام عليه عباد الله قال الله تعالى في الكتابه المبين بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وبعد Last Thursday, my mom, my mother, she called me, and as is her weekly tradition, before I give a khutbah, she was going to tell me what I should give a khutbah about. So my mom, she has this weekly thing where she calls and tells me, Abdurrahman, I heard a lecture, or I read a hadith, or I read an ayah, and I want you to talk about this when you talk to people. And at that moment, I heard her on the phone, and I heard this silence. So I thought that the phone disconnected, so I said, you know, mom, are you there? And then she said, yes, I'm here, but I heard her in her voice, she was crying. So I thought to myself, what did you hear that caused your heart to tremble? Like, what, what did I hear that, what did you hear that caused you to start shedding tears? And she said, Abdurrahman, I heard this lecture about a hadith that I've heard time and time again. But at the end of the lecture, she said, the teacher, the sheikh, he asked a question of the audience that she said, Wallahi, it shook me to my core. The hadith that she was referencing is a hadith that's very famous in our tradition, where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in his effort to educate his companions and to educate us, he taught us about an event that happened before us. And he said, and this is narrated in the books of hadith like Sahih Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi and uh, Nasa'i and others, Riyadh al-Salihin. He said that there was a time where there were three men, three people who were on a journey. And due to the inclement weather, the rain, they had to take shelter and so they went into a cave. They went and they found this cave in the mountains when they were walking on their journey. And the weather was so bad, the rain was so bad that they ran into the cave. But because of the weather and because of the, the shape of the cave and the entrance, the weather and the wind and the rain had caused a giant rock, a boulder, to fall and to exactly fall on the mouth of the cave, meaning that now that they were in this cave and the boulder was there, they had no exit. There was no way to get out. And so the first thing they did was they told each other. The hadith says, قَالَ بَعْدُهُمْ لِبَعْدٍ اِرْدِعُوا اللَّهَ بِأَفْضَلِ عَمِلْتُهُمَا That call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on or through using a deed that you did something that you did that you only did for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. And this is a very interesting response to trial and difficulty. You know, you're stuck in a cave. You have no idea how you're going to get out. You tried to push the boulder. All three of you tried, but your muscle couldn't help. And so they then turn to one another. And the first thing they say is ask Allah for help. So each of them, in a moment of desperation, raises their hands to Allah in the cave, and each of them share a moment from their history where they did a deed that they did only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first one he says, Ya Allah, and they each recount the story. He says, Ya Allah, you know that I am a shepherd. You know that I have a flock, and you know that as part of my responsibilities or as part of my benefit from this job, I take milk from these animals. And Ya Allah, you know that every time I take milk, Ya Allah, I go back and even though I have my own family and my own children, 
I first go to the home of my parents and I make sure that they drink before I even give my family the milk to drink. I make sure that my parents have been nurtured and nourished before I even nurture and nourish myself or my own family, my own children. He said, Ya Allah, you remember that one time where I went back to my parents' home and it was late and I found them sleeping, Ya Allah? And Ya Allah, you remember that one time that I sat there and I did not want to disturb their sleep because they were my parents and out of love and respect for them, I wanted them to rest. They looked so tired. And I sat there all night with the milk in my hands waiting because perhaps maybe they might wake up in the middle of the night hungry asking where was the milk today. And I sat there to the point where my own children began to say, Dad, Baba, Dad, Abu, can we have some milk now? We've been waiting for so long. And I sat there until the morning. After recounting this story, the first man said, Ya Allah, in kunta ta'lam, that I did this. If you know, Ya Allah, that I did this for your sake alone, then Allah, please move the rock that we can nara minha sama, that we can see from it now when you move it a little bit of the sky. At that moment, when the man said, Ya Allah, if I did this for your sake alone, please move the rock. When he said that, the rock shifted slightly. The second man begins his story. He says, Ya Allah, you know that there was a woman that I was deeply in love with, that I was extremely attracted to, and we had feelings for one another. And Ya Allah, you know that I had the opportunity to have extramarital affairs with her. And that one time I beckoned or I called for her and we met up to engage in extramarital activity. And I was at the moment, I was at that moment, right when we were about to engage with one another, she reminded me to fear Allah. And I remembered in my heart, oh Allah, I remembered my consciousness and fear of you and I stopped. He says, oh Allah, if I did this for your sake, ya Allah, if I did this only for you, ya Allah, then please move the boulder, move the rock so that we can see from it a bit of the sky. So the, the man said, if I was doing this for your sake, if I avoided the temptation, ya Allah, for your sake, then please move the boulder. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then shifted the boulder slightly. The third man then, after seeing this happen now twice, called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, Ya Allah, I employed someone to do some work for me. I employed a person to do some work for me. And after they did this work for me, Ya Allah, I owed them a certain payment, a certain uh, grain, a certain amount of grain. And in that, I asked them to take their grain, but for some reason they refused, Ya Allah. So they left and I took their grain and I then invested it multiple times. So over the years I took the grain, I invested it, and from that grain I was able to yield to purchase cows and sheep and much more than the grain itself was worth. The man then came back, the laborer then came back and demanded his payment. And the third man said, Ya Allah, I could have just given him the grain that I owed him. But because I used his payment and invested it and yielded more, I told him that, you see all of this, all of these animals and these livestock? He said, yes. He said, all of that belongs to you. It came from the grain that you were owed. The man actually became shocked and told me, are you lying? Are you joking with me? Are you making fun of me? And the man said, no. The third man said, no, it all belongs to you. He took that and he left. So the third man then at that moment called and said the same dua as the first two. Ya Allah, if you know that I did this for your sake alone, Ya Allah, then please move the boulder. And the boulder then shifted completely out of the way. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu told us this incredible hadith with so many different virtues in it. But today we're going to talk about a few. And this is the core of our relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. All three of these stories, all three of these events have a couple things in common. The first and foremost is that they all highlight what is known in our religion as al-ikhlas, as sincerity. 
Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he defined ikhlas as when a person does something for the sake of Allah, they do some sort of act of obedience to Allah, and they have no one else in their mind and in their heart besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is difficult. This is tough. Because sometimes you could be doing it to please somebody else, whether it's your parents, or your kids, or your spouse, or your friends, or your community, and that could impact your intention in your heart. But Ibn al-Qayyim said, no, if a person has ikhlas, that means that the only one that they're thinking about when they're doing the deed is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not thinking about if they're going to get in trouble with anybody, or if they're going to please or impress anybody. They're only thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my mother, going back to the phone call now, at the end of that, when she told me the story, she still had tears in her eyes. And she said to me, Abdurrahman, the Shaykh asked a question that shook me when he finished narrating the hadith. I said, Mom, what was the question? She said, Abdurrahman, he said to us, if you were the fourth person in the cave and the boulder had only moved a little bit, do you have a deed that was so sincere, that was done for the sake of Allah, that you would have been able to raise your hands and been a part of the group that moved the boulder? Or if you had called upon Allah, perhaps would the boulder not have moved at all? And this was the question that she said caused her to start crying. Have I done anything so sincere and so full of only la ilaha illallah that it would literally be able to move mountains. And the shaykh then concluded and said, brothers and sisters, sincerity is such a strong power that the believer has that it can take an obstacle that seems impossible, that seems immovable. And when sincerity is added to the action, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make the impossible possible. He can move the immovable. He can change the unchangeable condition. Whatever we perceive a difficulty to be, if we do something for Allah's sake alone, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can facilitate that. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, اِتَّقِ النَّارِ وَلَوْ بِشَقِّ تَمْرَةٍ He said, Fear, uh, protect yourself from the fire, even if it's only with half a date. What is half a date worth in financial monetary assessment? What is half a date worth? When you give charity half a date, Please, when you sign up for the sustainers program, try to commit more than half a day, inshallah, right? Because it's not worth that much. It's only worth like maybe 30 cents, but subhanAllah, the hadith here, the Prophet ﷺ says, never underestimate any deed if it's done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this goes for you and for us. Meaning we should never underestimate our deeds. We should never say, oh, I'm only a simple Muslim, I only pray and I only, no. You pray, subhanAllah, you worship Allah, and we should also never underestimate the deeds of other people. And this is a disease that flows through the community, is that we see someone and we say, oh, yeah, they might do this little thing, but they have all these other deficiencies that they have. Oh, they might do this on the week, and they might come to Jum'ah once a week, but they're not really a good Muslim. Don't ever underestimate anyone's deeds, whether it's your own or someone else's, because subhanAllah, the power of sincerity in that deed may as well change their entire course of life. Imam Ghazali, he narrates a hadith in one of his writings where he says that there was a man who was to collect some debts. And I've told this story before, but think about this for a moment. He had done no good in his life ever. The hadith says that he was very deficient in his relationship with Allah, but he used to give loans to people all the time. Free loans, no interest, free loans. One day he told his debt collector to go and tell everybody that your loans have been forgiven. I have forgiven all of your loans. No one is going to pay me back. All of your loans have been forgiven. The man then dies and we learn from the hadith that he will be resurrected on the day of judgment like all of us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have a conversation with him. And will say, what is it that you did in your life? And the man will say, I didn't do much, Ya Allah. I didn't do much. But one thing that I did, Ya Allah, is that I had a lot of people who owed me money. And one day I woke up with this sincere feeling in my heart that I wanted to forgive all of them their debt. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that forgiving debt is one of the most beautiful and illuminating deeds that a person can do, is forgiving someone's debt. Even though he said, 
that the person does not have to do that. They don't have to forgive it, but it's good. So he said, Ya Allah, I woke up one day and I wanted to forgive everyone their debt and I did so. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned to the angels Azza wa Jal and he says to the angels, this man forgave those people who owed him, who transgressed him, who owed him money. Then Allah says, but no one is better at forgiving someone who transgresses than me. And so let it be known that although this man did no other good in his life, I'm talking about no prayer, no fasting, nothing else, possibly no sadaqah, he said, let it know, be known that I have forgiven this man all of his sins. Because of that one deed of sincerity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed that man entrance into paradise. So brothers and sisters, we need to really think about this question. If we were the fourth person in that cave, do we have that moment that we shared with Allah intimately? You know, one of the downfalls of the age that we live in is that everything is public. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the internet in general, everything is public and we do things always in the sight of people. How many of us take time each day just between us and Allah, not even in front of our spouses or kids or families, where we raise our hands to Allah and we have a conversation with Him alone. How many of us make sure that we take time to do some worship in the privacy of a room where no one can see us so that we can have that relationship with Allah that is special? You know when there's two very close friends? I want you to think of your best friend. You know when there's two very, very close friends? They share experiences together that no one else has besides those two. And they can simply look at one another and they can give each other a smile and they will know that they're talking about this certain experience. I have friends that we've had experiences together that will keep us connected for our entire lives no matter how far we live apart. How many of us have these experiences with Allah? That we're just alone and we know, Ya Allah, you remember that one time when I got up in the middle of the night and I prayed to you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, you remember that one time when I got my paycheck and I really, really, really wanted to buy this thing, but Ya Allah, I donated a big portion of it for your cause, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, you remember that one time that there was that person in need and I woke up early on the weekend and went and I gave them food, Ya Allah. All these secret deeds. How many of us have these deeds? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in our deeds of sincerity to Him. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept. We ask Allah subhanahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower us with sincerity and to give us the ability to do things for his sake alone. For his sake alone. Because as we learn in the hadith about riya, about showing off, that a person will come on the day of judgment with mountains full of good deeds in front of them. And they will become so excited. They will see the good deeds and they will say, what is this? And they'll be told, this is your good deeds. And then at a moment's notice, at the snap of a finger, the deeds will blow away like sawdust in the wind. And the person will become fearful and will say, what happened? Why, why did this happen? Where did my deeds go? And they'll be told, this is because when you were in front of people, you did something. But when you were alone, you did something completely different. When you were with others, you acted a certain way. But when you were by yourself, you did not act that way. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from such a punishment and to give us acceptance of all of our deeds as we know that only deeds that are accepted are those that are sincere. Aqulu kawli hadha wa astaghfir Allah li wa lakum wa li sa'il al-muslimin wa al-muslimat fa astaghfiru inna hu hu al-ghafur rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على إمام الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم آمين. So now we all understand comprehensively the importance and the power of ikhlas, of sincerity for Allah. But how do we how do we apply it? How do we cure ourselves of the disease of riyat so that we can do things for Allah's sake to the point where we can move mountains like the three men that were mentioned in the cave? The first is to ask ourselves and to do some self-evaluation. Look at how you respond when you are with people versus by yourself. The, one of the questions that one of the great scholars of Tazkiyah he asked, he said, when you're with people, do you get up to pray more urgently than when you're by yourself? Are you, when you're with people, are you more excited to do good than when you're by yourself? 
He said, if you are always rushing to do good when people are around, as opposed to when you're by yourself, this could be a sign that a person lacks ikhlas because the presence of others and the potential praise that they might give makes us quickly run to do good in front of them. There's a famous story, I don't know if it's necessarily true, but it tells a very good point of a young man who was praying in the masjid and the father of the woman he wanted to marry was behind him. And the father was speaking to his friend about the quality of the prayer of this young man was saying, look at how long he's praying, mashallah. Look at how much khushur he has. Look at his love for the salah in the masjid. And the young man, as he was hearing this, he extended his prayer. And he was enjoying the praise. And he was loving the compliment. And they kept praising and praising and praising him until finally they stopped. So when the young man was praying and he heard that they stopped complimenting him, he began fearful because he said, I want to marry his daughter. I have to keep impressing him. So during the prayer, he turned around and said, and I'm fasting as well, right? <laughs> to kind of give this idea that I, and you can keep going, keep praising me. Look at all the khair that I'm doing. This is the absence of ikhlas. This is literally the absence of ikhlas, that someone is only doing something so that they can be get praise. Another example that the scholars say is, can you, subhanAllah, this is difficult, can you be in a room where someone is praising what you did, but you don't claim it? Can you be in a room where someone is saying, man, whoever grilled that chicken, they are the iron chef, mashaAllah. And you grilled it, but you say, yeah, subhanAllah. It was amazing. Whoever did that is incredible, subhanAllah. Can you, the scholar says, can you let the praise go by you, walk by you without claiming it? Because that shows that you did it only for the sake of Allah, not even for someone to praise you. So these are two things that we can work on, is to be more urgent and to lengthen our ibadat when we are in private as opposed to when we are in public. How many of us pray as many sunnah prayers at home as we do when we're in the masjid? Now don't get me wrong, there's some barakah to good environments, of course. But we should force ourselves to do more khair in private so that when shaitan comes to us and when he tempts us with hypocrisy and nifaq, we can say to him, Ya shaitan, leave me alone. I do more in private than I've ever done in public. I do more that no one knows about than I've ever done where people know about it. The second lesson that I want to conclude with, brothers and sisters, is that tonight we are going to have a very important forum, community forum, inshallah, on what has been happening these past you know, few days, this past week, the attacks that happened in Paris and Beirut and in now you know, in, in, there's in Central Africa and Mali this morning, there was a hostage situation, all kinds of chaos that's happening. And unfortunately, the community of believers worldwide feels the burden of this chaos, even though we ourselves had absolutely nothing to do with it. So we're feeling the burden, but we didn't do anything. So how do we respond to these things? I want to leave you with one point from this khutbah. One point. And then tonight, inshallah, we'll talk about the rest. If you remember correctly, in the story of the three men, they were walking on a journey, and then all of a sudden they were hit with horrible weather. This reminds me of the Muslim Ummah that we are moving forward on the Salat al-Mustaqim towards Allah and we are hit with horrible scenarios, SubhanAllah. And we have to go and run and take cover sometimes, you know, just like the three men ran into the cave to hide from the horrible weather. And when they got there, something worse happened. And this can happen to us. A bombing happens, we begin to get fearful. The next day, another one happens. We say, Ya Allah, how much worse can it get? The weather was bad, they ran in the cave and the boulder, Ya Allah, we, the weather was bad, now the boulder's here, how much worse can it get? But in that scenario, SubhanAllah, look at what the first thing they did was. They realized that in the middle of the storm, you need to seek shelter with Allah. They said, call upon Allah and ask Him based on your relationship with Him if He'll help us. They saw the key to their salvation from their problems, not their own individual strength, not their academic strength, not their career, not their financial wealth, but their relationship with Allah. That was what they saw as being the solution to their issues. So as we get hit and bombarded 
with test and trial of our community, one after another, how many of us, we actively turn to Allah first to solve our problems? We look to other organizations, we look to politicians, we look to donations, we even look to other community members, but how many of us say, Ya Allah, please help us and relieve us from this difficulty and give us aid in this time of trial, Ya Allah, Ameen. That's the lesson that we take, inshallah, from these horrible tragedies that keep happening, is that they should bring us closer to Allah, not take us further away. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us proximity to Him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to gather us together on the Day of Judgment at the kawthar of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, drinking from His blessed hands. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure our sick, to forgive those who have passed away, and to give aid to those who are being oppressed all over the world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of our sins and to grant us Jannat al-Firdaws al-A'la bi ghari hisab with no accountability. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون أقيم الصلاة